Would you like me to? Okay. So I'll share screen now. I'll go to the presentation. Can you let me know, please, if you can see this in in the proper view, the yes, slides? Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Well, I'll just introduce myself first and and say thank you for to everybody for joining today and for the invitation. So my name is Garodo Fuelan and I'm the publisher at F1000, which is part of the Taylor and Francis group. Uh, part of my role is to support the development of partner gateways such as the IIARP. I'm joined in the presentation today by my colleague Jess Tor, who's the editorial team lead, um, also based in the UK, and uh, she works on the editorial checks of articles submitted to IIARP. Now, this is just a brief outline of what I will be speaking about in today's workshop. I'll, I'll begin by explaining to you the F1000 research model, which some aspects of that model differ from a traditional academic journal, so they may be unfamiliar to you. I'll talk then about the pre-publication checks that we conduct on every article submission to F1000 research, including to the IIARP gateway. Um, and it will be important for everybody to understand what an article requires for it to pass our checks. After that, I'll dedicate a section to talking about our open data policies. So open data is a core pillar of, of F1000 research and our policies. So all of the submitting authors must be aware of the requirements that we have around data. And finally, I'll, I'll summarize the previous um, slides and, and the kind of checks and requirements that we have. And then I'll turn over for questions from attendees. So jumping right in, this is the publishing model. I'm going to detail here the how how the journey works for any articles submitted to the IIARP gateway. So we'll just go through it from beginning to end. Now, whenever a paper is submitted to the IIARP gateway, it's checked by our in-house editorial team for suitability and eligibility. I'll discuss those checks in more detail later in the presentation, but assuming that the article has passed the criteria that we have, it's sent then to our typesetters and can be published online in as little as two weeks. Now, at this point, the paper is published, but it's not yet peer reviewed. This is one way that we differ from a traditional journal, which typically does peer review and then publishes. We do it the other way around. We, we make sure the paper is ready to be published by our team, our in-house team. It's published and then the peer review begins. Um, when it is published, the article receives a DOI, so a digital object identifier. It's immediately available to the wider community to be read and, and to be cited as well and it's indexed in Google Scholar. Now, after we publish the paper, that's when the peer review stage is initiated. So this process is led by the authors um, and they can suggest reviewers to us, people who they think would be most suitable to review the paper, as long as they meet our criteria for peer reviewers. And our editorial team will also just conduct some checks to ensure that there's no conflict of interest between authors and reviewers, typical of a traditional journal also. Now, any reviewer reports that we receive, they are published online and alongside details of the reviewer's names and affiliations. So everything is transparent. You can see who the reviewers are, where they're based, and you can see all the comments they have about the article. Uh, the reviewers are asked to only focus on technical aspects of the paper and, and the soundness of it, um, not any subjective assessment because the paper is already published. We're only concerned now with improving it and making sure that it's, um, you know, it's ready to be indexed. So each reviewer provides a written report of your article, as well as selecting one of three statuses. So the three statuses that they can choose are approved, approved with reservations, or not approved. Um, and once they, once they do that, once they submit their report and choose one of these statuses, then like a typical peer review process, the authors look at those reports, they improve the paper, they make changes based on the reviewer recommendations, and it enters this kind of cycle of the reviewers then come back and look at what changes have been made. Um, what happens then, typically after one or two rounds, but it, it can go on, is that the, the reviewers decide whether they, you know, they're happy with the paper, if they think it's actually at a, at a good stage now and it can be indexed, and they can change their status. So if formerly they were at approved reservations, for example, and the author has made improvements to the paper, they may change and give it a new status then, which is approved. 
in order for a paper to pass peer review and be sent to relevant indexers and repositories, your article needs one of two statuses. It either needs to have two reviewers who have given a rep an approved status, or it needs one reviewer to give it an approved status and two reviewers to give it an approved reservation status. So if your paper receives one of these two statuses from the reviewers, in which case, in this case, it can mean there's three reviewers assigned, um, then it's ready to be indexed. It's considered past peer review and it will be sent to Scopus, to PubMed and to other indexing sites. So that's really the journey. It's submission, in-house editorial checks. If it passes them, it's published, reviewers are invited um, and there's a review stage then goes on with reviewers submitting reports, the author revising the paper and then these statuses hopefully will appear. So that's the description of the, the entire publication process from, from beginning to end. But in order for all that to happen, the article must first pass the in-house editorial checks. We refer to these as pre-publication checks and I'll take you through each one of them now. Uh, please note that the article must pass all of these checks in order to be published. So what do our editorial team look for as requirements for publication on the IIARP gateway? So first, the work must be original. The manuscript or, or substantial parts of it must not have been previously published or under review by another journal. And we use a, a plagiarism detection software to ensure that the work is original. Any text in the article that has been previously published elsewhere must have quotation marks around it and a, you know, and a reference to the original source or else be paraphrased and similarly have a, a reference to the original source. We do accept preprints. So if your article has been published to a preprint server, um, we do accept those. That, you know, it's not considered plagiarism to have it on a preprint server and then publish with us. We just ask that you, um, you include a statement saying that this has previously appeared on a preprint server. So secondly, at least one of the authors must be a qualified researcher, a scholar. Um, and typically that means that they have a graduate degree and at least some existing publication record already. At least one of the authors should have this. Third, the article must be written in clear English. So we, we don't provide in-house language improvement services on the IIARP gateway. So the article must already be of a, a high language quality before submission. And on our web pages, you can find a list of recommended English language copy editing services if, if you're not aware of any already. I've included here, this is actually a link where you can find that list and I'll be sharing the slides afterwards. So you will have access to, to that link and you can see it. Uh, fourth, the, the, the paper, the reported study must meet all applicable research and publication standards. Now we recommend, we, we strongly recommend that authors check our editorial policies carefully before submitting in order to understand the guidelines and ethical requirements. Um, and this is actually linked to where you can find that. But I'll, I'll talk more about the standards on the next slide. So certain types of research papers have specific reporting guidelines. Um, I've included here two examples. If you, for example, are publishing a clinical trial in pharmacology, there's a, a consort guidelines, or if you're doing a systematic review in, in any discipline, there's PRISMA guidelines. Now this means that the research and the writing of the paper must have been conducted in a standardized way. And I'll include more information on the actual reporting guidelines on the next slide, including a web link to the database of reporting guidelines for different types of research. I'll just say that not all research articles need to have a reporting guideline. It's just for specific kinds like the examples I provide here. The next point then is that studies must have received appropriate ethical approval and consent from participants if, if there's human subjects involved or animal subjects. And a statement about this must be included in the article. So that means there must be a clear ethical approval and consent statement if, if there's any human or animal participants. I'll give an example of, of a good consent or ethical statement in the, next, um, in the next slide. Could I just ask the, all of the audience to please mute their mics? I'm getting some, some noise from somebody right now. Now, the next point then is that all underlying methodological details and relevant data must be included. This, uh, this means that we, we require that a data availability statement be included with every submitted article. Now, I said at the beginning with the outline that I'll dedicate a specific section to this, so you can see more detail in a moment. Uh, finally, then, as, an, as a requirement, the authors must agree to pay any article processing charges linked with the submission. We do have a waiver system in place for, for certain countries, and you can find more information about that on the platform website. 
So just on the reporting guidelines that I mentioned, um, some types of studies require particular reporting guidelines. And as I said, this is just a way to structure your article and conduct your study according to a standardized format. I've included here quite a number of um, examples of studies that must adhere to reporting guidelines. So that if, you know, for example, if you are working on a case report or a systematic review, um, you, you know that there needs to be a certain structured way that you write your paper. Um, I'll say again that not all research papers need to follow these guidelines. And when you do receive these slides from the, from the conference organizer, you can access this link here, this equator network, and that's where you can find information and, and know, for example, if the type of paper that you're working on does require reporting guidelines. Now on ethical approval, articles should be submitted with, with an ethical approval statement. If, there's, um, if you're working, for example, in your research with humans or animals, you must obtain ethical approval from an institutional review board um, before actually carrying out the research. When I say human subject, when I say human here in terms of human subjects, this is anything from um, drug experimentation and clinical trials to kind of softer research involving humans like interviews or online surveys. All of these, anytime there's a human participant in the study, there, there needs to be ethical approval. Um, and the details when you provide, um, when you submit your article to us, and you provide the ethical um, approval details, what it needs to have is the name of the institution, your review board name that approved it, and any permit numbers. So this is an example that I've pulled from a, an existing article where the ethical statement includes the name of the university and the university's ethical clearance committee, and also any protocol numbers associated. This ethical statement also includes a, a note on consent, which is the other part that is necessary when you have human subjects. So there's two kinds of consent that need to be obtained when there's, when, there's humans, when there's human participants involved in your study. The first is consent to participate, which means that um, anybody who participates in your study needs to, ha you need to have written informed consent. So you need to provide them with a written statement of what the research is going, how you're going to conduct your research, what it's going to be used for, so that they can read that and sign it. So it's got all three aspects. It's written, it's on a piece of paper, it's informed, it has all the information about the study and they have consented, so they provided written consent. So that's necessary. And you need to include a statement that written con informed consent uh, was obtained as part of the ethical statement. You don't need to provide the, sig the signed statements. We, we don't need to see them, but it's good to have them ready because we may ask for them if there's a concern. The other point then is, if you're publishing any identifiable data about um, human subjects. So for example, if you do a case report in, in medicine, it's a separate consent. They need, the participants need to actually consent to you publishing their identifiable data. And that can be age, lo location, gender, occupation. So there's, there's two levels of consent. Often it's just that you need to receive the first one, but if, if you're publishing any identifiable data, you need both. And I have here, again, some examples of consent statements that have been included on papers that have previously been published with us. Uh, one final point I'll say about this consent procedure is that if the participants in your study are, are children, minors, or they have a reduced mental capacity and they, they cannot give consent, then the consent must be obtained from a parent or legal guardian. Now, just to summarize then the, this ethical and consent procedure, if your study involves human participants, you need to include in your article details of the ethical committee approval, the institution and review board name and permit numbers. Um, and you need to include a statement saying that written informed consent was received from the participants in the two layers I mentioned, whichever is applicable. If your study involves animals, it's just this, this first point. You need to include, again, details of ethical committee approval, institution, review board name, and permit numbers. Now, I spoke before about how important our open data policies are, and we cannot publish any articles that do not contain a clear data availability statement. I'll take you through what I mean by, by data and open data and what our requirements are, and then some examples of data availability statements. So data... It's a very broad term. It means any material that the author uses to support their study, whether they created it themselves or generated it themselves or whether they found it somewhere else. Now, the data can be qualitative or quantitative. It can be 
factual or non-factual. It can be numerical like Excel spreadsheets, textual like um, Word documents or, or files, or it can be audio visual. So it can be a video or a, a recording that you did of an interview. So data can really be um, anything. And in terms of just um, examples of data, just, to, just so you can see the, the range of things that are considered as data, you know, it's anything from field notes. So things like in anthropology, um, in social science, like education, you have audio and video interviews, um, surveys or questionnaires for psychology, political science, Western blot gels for microbiology, um, software code for ICT, and genome sequences for bioinformatics. All of these are data. And so we support an open data policy. So all of this should be made open. Now, how we summarize our policy is that data should be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And this means that unless there are justifiable legal or ethical reasons why you cannot share your data, um, you must otherwise make it available for other researchers when you publish your paper on the IIARP gateway. And our editorial team will check that upon submission. Now, regardless of whether you share your data or not, your paper must include a statement about the data availability, saying where it can be accessed or why it cannot be um, made available. But when you do share your data, it must be in a non-proprietary format with adequate metadata. Uh, this simply means that it, it, it needs to be made available on a website, in a repository, that there's no barriers for access. There's no kind of copyright um, issues involved or anything like this, that it's simple for me or, or somebody else to access it. And adequate metadata means there's a, a you know, a, a good description of what the data is um, and how it's, um, how it's composed. So for example, is it in Excel files? Now, the data should also be hosted in a trusted repository with a persistent identifier. So not, for example, uh, it shouldn't be hosted on a blog that may disappear in, in six months, but it should be in one of our trusted repositories. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of those in a moment. Um, and you can find them on our data guidelines page, so you will have access to this. And data should be published under what we call a Creative Commons Zero license, where it's safe and legal to do so. Um, and this means that other researchers can use it without encountering legal or financial barriers. So really, again, as open as possible. Now, I just have here, this is just a screenshot from the F1000 research homepages um, to show you where you can find this. And I do have the link on the previous slide, but this is just um, on that data guidelines webpage, we have a, a, a very long list of trusted repositories. Um, where we explain, you know, what kind of data that they accept, because some of them only accept, for example, um, you know, genomic data, but some of them accept any kind, like Dryad. And we have a link to each of these. Now that this list goes on and on further down. Um, and also, when you do upload your data to a repository, we have here in this column information on what you should include in your data availability statement. So, for example, the title of the data, the name of it, um, and the DOI, so where it can be accessed. Just briefly, some examples of good data availability statements from articles already published at F1000. So this one, this is something that would appear on the published article. You have here the title of the data set. So it's very clear what, it, where, what it's called, the, the link to it. So you can access it easily by clicking on this. And then a description. So you, this is your meta, well, this is all your metadata, but this is a description of the kind of data that's there. So you have Excel spreadsheets um, and then this Creative Commons Zero license. So data is available under this license. So it's, it's, it's very easy and, and convenient to access and use. This is a slightly different data availability statement where you still have the, the link to, um, to where you can access it, but there's a slight restriction involved in that you need to register in order to access the, on the website, you need to register in order to access the data. And it's only granted for legitimate research purposes. So this is kind of the halfway between as open as possible, as closed as necessary, where it is, it is accessible, but you need to register and you need to be only using it for legitimate research purposes. Now, finally, oftentimes all of the data in your study is actually just going to be included in the paper. It doesn't need to have any files um, uploaded to a repository and that's perfectly fine. You still need a data availability statement, but it can simply say something like all data underlying the results are available as part of the article and no additional data source are required. 
So that's that's really the the sum of all the editorial requirements. So all the things that our, our team checks before a paper is published, um, and and each of those criteria must be met. So I'll just briefly go through them again one final time for you. Um, in order for your your article to be published, the the paper must first be you ensure it's original, so it must not contain any previously published material. Uh, there must be at least one author who's a qualified researcher scholar on the list of authors. So. As I say, you know, a, a graduate degree with a with at least a, a, a small publication record already. The paper must be written in clear English. Um, it must have a pre received appropriate ethical approval and consent from participants, and, and a statement about that must be included in the article. Um, it must adhere to appropriate reporting guidelines, if applicable, if applicable, and um, it must include all underlying methodological details, relevant data. So that data availability statement must be included. Now, if you don't have these requirements already prepared before submitting, the article that you submit will, will probably face long delays because the pre-publication team will have to have a, a back and forth discussion with the author to clarify what's missing or what needs to be changed. And the, the article may be rejected if in fact there's, there's, it doesn't meet enough criteria. So it's really important that all of these things are prepared before submission. Now, as mentioned, I'll circulate this slide deck among attendees after the meeting so everybody can use it as a, a reference tool in their own time. I'll just conclude by, by encouraging all authors and prospective authors to please ensure they read the guidelines and policies on our web pages when preparing their articles for submission. So with that, I'll finish my presentation and thanks again for, for having me and thank you for your attention. So at this point, I'm happy to turn it over to attendees for a few questions and Jess and, and myself, we should hopefully be able to answer any queries that you have. So I'll stop sharing now and we can turn it over. If any question from the participants, they can ask shortly, please. Be conclusive. I think, I mean, we, we may still have a question, but if there's none at this time, you know, we're certainly available. We can collect questions by email also and be able to respond to people if they want to take some time to, to consider the presentation before asking, you know, as we will be sharing the slides, people can look through the slides, um, you know, and then maybe a question might appear and, and they're free to also email us at that time and we can, we can respond to people. I think it was very clear and uh, every information was clear and thank you so much. Uh, I think there will be no such question and all the participants I think are already clear about the process of submission. And uh, if there is any question they can ask us or they can email or they can communicate with the F1000 uh, research uh, editorial team and the uh, they can ask for help. I think there is no such thing. As for my understanding, everything is clear. Okay, well, that's that's good news. That's always good to hear. Yeah. So is there any question from the participants? They can ask now or they can uh, ask us later. We will uh, share the yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so, so how how important is the team of uh, the journal is important because there are a lot of teams and sub teams as well, and we see a lot of rejections which take place just because you know team and the sub teams. Um, I would just tell you um, in GBR we had just submitted a one paper and initially they had published about the surf themes. We wrote a paper on the surf themes, but then we got a rejection after four months. You know. Uh, that's not matching to our our team. Now that was quite disappointing. But uh, so you can you can just tell us how we could be a little more careful, you know. And I would also be requesting your uh, email ID so that we can we can even write back to you if we, we have any further questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and in themes, there's no specific scope. You know, I'll, I'll just use the word scope as well to, um, for other people, because of course, as in, I think in the experience you had, 
the the journal had a specific scope or theme and then they said well look this is this is outside of it but they took four months um on the f1000 platform and on the iiarp gateway there's no specific theme there so it 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 shouldn't be that your paper is rejected because it doesn't fit within a certain theme. You know, we publish really the range from, from humanities to engineering and, and everything in between with biomedical and everything. So it, it, there shouldn't be a problem, at least in that point of view. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so I think everyone is clear. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much again for, for having myself and, and Jess. And of course, as I said, I'll, I'll share the slides um, and they can be circulated among the, the organization. And then any questions that people do have coming up afterwards, we're happy to respond to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll let you guys go now. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.